<sighs> you know what? I just gotta ask. Just gotta ask. Is it piss poor research, or is it dumbassery? Dumbassery, or is it a deflection so that others will not research and make connections? It's it, it's almost like something, some information is being protected. When I first started researching subjects that I found my friends, relatives and teachers couldn't help me with, the internet was not actually available back in those days, so research was only possible thanks to libraries and to trust the word of academics and scholars. You could only find out about stuff if you actually knew what to ask for in the first place, and even then you had to develop a rather keen sense for inserted opinions and how to read between the lines. Especially when you had two scholars disagreeing with each other, or, you know, over each other's work, and all you had to go on was their words about the matter. But nowadays, we're all used to using the internet as a research tool, and isn't it great? Now it's second nature to use videos and blogs as sources, as well as online libraries, as well as newspaper and academic archives. But there's a reason why the tongue-in-cheek phrase evolved that something must be true because I saw it on the internet. Too many people simply accept what they see because it's too much bother to challenge it, and so they never dig down to make sure they're not being duped. Just because someone presents something in a convincing way does not mean they are necessarily giving you accurate information. This could be for any number of reasons. Some may be deluded fantasists and believe the nonsense they're actually peddling, while others might be well-meaning enough, but they are trusting the research of others and so are unwittingly spreading erroneous information. Then there's the conspiracy theorists, a rather umbrella term that covers anything from the insane, the enthusiastic jokers such as internet trolls, the people with pet theories but have zero evidence to support it, and this goes all the way up to the more nuanced, educated guesswork by people that are experts in their field. And of course, let's not forget that there are professional disinformation specialists out there who deliberately share incorrect information to mislead the public for any number of reasons, ranging from hiding real conspiracies such as sinister government cover-ups to anybody with skeletons in their closet. You know, you know they're trying desperately to keep their secrets locked firmly in that closet we'll be looking at some videos that a couple of other YouTubers have made, and this will highlight the folly of trusting the research of others, or possibly not actually doing any proper research at all. What makes it all the more acute is that these videos were actually made as attempts to correct the videos that other people had made that they felt were wrong, so I hope the irony is not lost in this regard. Now, the subject of the videos may be a bit obscure to most people, but they allow me to talk about one of the most common misconceptions about the Freemasons, namely that they spawned from the Knights Templar. And that's a myth that always triggers me every time I hear it. So, to give you a bit of background, the videos are about the relationship between the Knights Templar, the Freemasons, and Jehovah's Witnesses. And this is in the context that Jehovah's Witnesses moved their British headquarters to a property they built on land that used to be owned by the Templars. So there must be significance in the fact that they chose that property because of Freemasons and Knights Templar, basically. I will not be discussing any matters of doctrine, and so there are aspects of the other videos that I won't even touch. If we're going to look at everything in the other videos, then we're talking about more than three hours of video, I think. And, you know, you know, it's, it's just, that, that would just be ridiculous to look at. But, you know, that having been said, I, I will make a statement about the Masonic connection to the founder of Jehovah's Witnesses. Because this way, the rest of the video can be dedicated to the Templar and Masonic misunderstandings and to hopefully shed light on the actual facts of the matter. There can be no doubt that Charles Russell was heavily connected with the Freemasons, as well as several other groups in the early years of the Bible student movement. He syncretised the doctrine and teachings from multiple sources, and promoted it as the correct form of Christianity rather than what was being taught in the mainstream churches. 
people who believe that this process was inspired by God choose to follow that path. A branch from this developed into the religion of Jehovah's Witnesses and the doctrines have continued to evolve over time. Now, I'm not trying to assess the credibility of Jehovah's Witnesses as a religion. You either have faith in their belief system or you don't. If you believe something is true, does the source matter or the actual information? Anyway, as I mentioned already, I don't really care about the philosophical side of this matter. There's enough to be looking at that does not require leaps of faith or speculation, and in that regard, I've edited together a two-minute clip to highlight the errors we'll be looking at today. And then they mentioned even the Hungarian flag. Um, those are Knights Templar symbols. Back then, when they created it, it was... Uh, Knights Templar based country. The leaders were. It was very Templar influenced. Where they had an occupation there. Very much influenced with the double cross and the everything. And yeah, I mean, how is that surprising? I mean, literally, how is that surprising? It's not a conspiracy. At all. It's like having a Nazi occupation and then having the symbol on there. Yeah. Now the Knights Templar are Freemasons. Because the thing with the Knights Templar is that they, I guess, apparently had a temple on this property. So there's a lot of significant history to this property. Well, the thing is with the Templars is they are famous for being the guardians of the grail. The guardians of the Holy Grail and, and guardians of the Ark of the Covenant. By 1309, Temple Farm at Chelmsford was given to a knight by the name of Hanningfield. Not a Templar, just a knight. This order dropped the Templar L emblem of two knights on a single horse and replaced it with a double Templar cross. Okay, then we're going to go down to emblem. Before we consider the next map, it is worth noting the medieval Templar emblem, the royal seal of the Crusader Kings, which is on display in the National Library of France. Before going any further, I would like to emphasise that I'm sure these people have nothing but the best of intentions, but that doesn't miraculously make their information correct. Okay, so we have a list of claims and assertions that possibly sound convincing to the casual observer. But let's now look at some of the points I've said are wrong and see if we can shed some light on what the real deal actually is. So we have that the Knights Templar were guardians of the Grail and the Ark of the Covenant. <sighs> well, this is just pure fantasy. You know, this is, this is Indiana Jones stuff. This is not history. Experts cannot even determine if the grail was an actual object or if it was just simply a metaphor. There is zero evidence for its existence outside the world of fantasy fiction. And naturally, this also means it has never been discovered to be guarded by the Templars or anybody else. So if you hear someone spouting this nonsense as hard fact, then you know you're listening to a fantasist. Similarly, while the Ark of the Covenant may have been a real artefact in ancient times, it has been lost since the Babylonians sacked Jerusalem more than 1500 years before the Templars were even conceived. Was it taken away as booty? Or was it destroyed in the devastation? Or was it secreted away and hidden? Nobody knows, because despite thousands of attempts to find it, the trail is stone cold and everyone comes out of their search empty handed and are only left with their own favourite theories. What is true is that the Templars were great collectors and traders of holy relics, but speculation about the Grail and the Ark of the Covenant remain pure speculation. But it's called Research into Temple Farm. Temple Farm, West Hanningfield, Chelmsford, UK, the new site for the religious order known legally as the Worldwide Order of Full-Time Servants of Jehovah's Witnesses. 
Okay, so what we can see here is this couple are reading information that has been sent to them. So this is research that somebody else has done, and so what they're doing is they're trusting that the other person has given them good information. Now, the person who sent this information has spent a bit, a bit of time on this, but they've still managed to get some fundamentals wrong. And if I do say so myself, that's understandable. The fields of research that make you, they give you a, a sort of antennae to wade through the snake oil bullshit surrounding the Templars, that does take a good number of years to actually develop. Okay, let's see how we go. Why is this specific building, building chosen for the map pen? It lines up perfectly with an old map from 1700s. This map can be viewed in person via the English National Archives. Okay, so I have, I've, basically I've edited out all the stuff that I do not want to talk about. Uh, and so there's a whole lot of stuff that's being talked about, about, oh, there's this building that's been designated with a number 33 on it, which incidentally I, I could not find independently outside the information that was provided in the zip file. It's, a, it's up to you what you actually believe in that regard. I'm not looking at the wild guesswork that's, in, that, that's, that's involved in this stuff. He's got the web page. And this is the old map. And as you can see right over there where it says old orders, see that little red dot? That's the area we're going to be talking about. Okay, now this next part is vital. But we'll see here, because they've not done the research, they do not understand that. And dare I say it, the person who submitted this uh, uh, information to them missed that this was a vital point as well. Okay, in the year 1136, Matilda, wife of then English King Stephen, or Stephen, don donates a 14,000 acre estate to the Templars in the Chelmsford area. So do you see where this is going? Known today as Cressing Temple, the first Templar farms and buildings were built in this area. A barley barn at Cressing Temple is the oldest standing timber frame barn in the world, later establishing their headquarters in London. One of the farms they built in this area was Temple Farm, West Hanningfield. The modern name for the area, West Hanningfield, comes from the later family name Hanningfields, who became who become owners of the land sometime after the Templar persecution that began on Friday the 13th in October in 1307. So let's unpack what we have so far. We have the date of 1136. We have Queen Matilda. The location of Chelmsford. Cressing Temple. We have some historic farm buildings. Temple Farm. West Hanningfield and the Hanningfield family name. Now, as far as the Hanningfield family is concerned, that's actually a bit of a red herring. It's, but since it's been mentioned, then I'll cover it. It's incorrect that the location was named after the Hanningfield family. It's actually the other way around. You see, we can tell this by looking at the meaning of the name. Hanning is an enclosed piece of ground, and a field is farmland. So Hanning fields are literally enclosed fields, either using walls or hedgerows on the perimeter. And the historic farm buildings indicate this area had good, fertile soil. Turning to the other information we have so far, we already have enough to solve the riddle of the double cross on the map. It's just a matter of knowing where to look. This is a copy of the History of the County of Essex, which was originally published in 1907. Now many people, they, they will deride the use of Wikipedia when doing research. I, I, I disagree with that, because so long as you have checked the citation for the entry that you're looking at and is good sound information, there is no problem with using Wikipedia. It's just a case of you just have to double check, that's all, it's as simple as that. When it comes to the entry for the history of Crescent Temple in Wikipedia, I ha as you can see, I've just checked this, it is quite literally a copy and paste of this page that's been used in the Wikipedia article. And Wikipedia is much easier for me to read, uh, not to mention it's uh, full of lovely hyperlinks that we can use, 
and so I'm perfectly happy to use this, but like I say, you've got to check your sources, and that doesn't suddenly stop just because you've arrived at Wikipedia. Okay, so here we have 1136. The manor of Cressing was granted to the Knights Templar by Matilda of Bologna. In England, she was quite often referred to as Queen Maud because her cousin was also called Matilda and she was referred to as Empress Matilda. And so these were vying factions where Empress Matilda... Well, basically there was, there, there was a, a civil war ensued as these branches of the family fought for the crown. This was actually referred to as the Anarchy. Yeah, you, yeah, you know, you know, we're, we're we're talking about a period of upheaval here. This is this is not some fantasy fairyland. You know, we're talking about a brutal period where they're kind of ransoming each other, throwing each other in dungeons, having to flee the land, that sort of stuff. Now, as it happens, Matilda of Bologna was rather well loved by the people. Empress Matilda, her cousin, was kind of hated by the people. In theory, Empress Matilda had a better claim to the throne than Stephen did. You know, Matilda's husband, the king, King Stephen. It's probably best if I don't get too sidetracked with the actual courtly intrigues, but there's a reason why the Knights Templar would be trusted, and that's because they did not have designs to try to grab the crown from the king. And so once Stephen had been crowned king, he himself uh, and Matilda, they would want uh, any support they could get. And you've got the Templars being effectively a neutral force. And so to give them patronage was a very sound tactical move. Alrighty, so we, we've, we, we've, we've established that the, the Templars definitely got this land. There's a 1400 acre site. It's, uh, and as it says here, a considerable agricultural enterprise, I'd say. You know, especially when you think of the size of England. You know, I'm, I'm aware that Americans w might be thinking, 1,400 acres, that's my back garden. You know, but for England, that's huge. So here we can see we, we've got Britain, uh, you, know, you know, the British Isles. And this highlighted area here is the county of Essex. And the stuff that we're talking about in Chelmsford is in here. See, Cressing, that's the Cressing Temples up here where the historic buildings are that are still standing today. Uh, with them, that's where the Templars were granted the right to hold a market. And so that effectively established a, um, a, a, a town around that market. That area here, stretching here, and stretching right down to just above this, this water, we have West Hanningfield. So hang on, can you get all that in the map, in the screen, should I say? Yep, Cressing, with them. West Hanningfield. Now, the, the 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 town of Chelmsford itself, it would uh, you know, it would have gone around that. Now, exactly how deep that was, like like east to west, I do not actually know. You know, yeah, you know, I've 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 not gone into that much detail. Uh, but but it's just basically establishing that uh, that that's a sizable uh, estate. I, I you know I, you know that's 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 sizable grounds. And so that was really helpful for the Templars to actually get a, a fully established and to start actually generating income of their own. See, because the Templars, for, for, for like the first uh, 20 years or so, they were actually pr like poor in as much that they relied on charity, you know, like donations from other people. So they never had quality horses to begin with. They never had quality armour to begin with. There was no uniform. Uh, it, you, know, you know, it was just basically whatever people sent them. And so there was some good stuff, there was some terrible stuff. This gift to them was basically a real, you know, like starting to give them a proper solid footing. The, the papacy, the Pope, had recognised them. They had the right to wear uh, their white mantles because they were then recognised as a pious order. They still did not have the right to wear a red cross at this point in time. You know, that, that would not come for another decade from 1136. Okay, so to uncover the mystery of this, what's what, what's called in the map the double cross, 
We need to actually, it's just simply a case of understanding the heritage of Matilda of Bologna. So the much loved Matilda of Bologna, or Queen Maud as she was called in England, it would just simply for you see this is the, this is what I'm saying about the good thing about Wikipedia as as long as you've already checked the the sources, because here I can just hi- hyperlink through to Matilda of Bologna, and we've also now got her predecessor her her success you, you know we've 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 got these links to these th- thoroughly researched family trees of, of, of like the, the European nobility and royal families. And what we're actually going to do is we're going to look at who her grandparents were, and that reveals the secret. So what we'll do is we will look at her father, just to, just to follow the link through, see, so Eustace III, and then we'll look at who his parents were. Okay, so we have Eustace the Second and Ida of Lorraine, where were his parents. Now Eustace the Second, he fought with William the Conqueror, so so he came over with William the Conqueror, fought at the Battle of Hastings, etc., etc., and that's how they actually got their English lands in the first place for Matilda to be able to be so generous with giving a donation of such a huge amount of land. So Ida of Lorraine was actually known for her pious works and she set up uh, several monasteries. This, she, she, so, so she ended up being sainted, so she was then considered, uh, like, as I say, like a saint and a noble woman. And what we have with Ida of Lorraine and the cousins being like the House of Anjou, we have the Cross of Lorraine and Anjou. Does this look familiar to anyone? Remember that road sign on the map? The Cross of Lorraine, known as Cross of Anjou in the 16th century, is a heraldic two-barred cross. And here the two-barred cross, that's, you could say that's the technical name for this. But of course, in everyday language, people would perhaps just simply call it a double cross. This is completely different, however, from like a heraldic double cross, or if you're talking about a Templar cross, and if you're, and then if you're talking about like a Templar double cross, it's not this. This is not it. However, I, what we can actually see from this is if we scroll down, the cross of Lorraine came from the Kingdom of Hungary to the Duchy of Lorraine. In Hungary, Bela III was the first monarch to use the two-barred cross as the symbol of royal power in the late 12th century. He probably adopted it from the Byzantine Empire, according to historian Paul Engel. Now, there's an aspect of this that I would actually dispute. However, what it does do, it establishes a connection between the cross of Lorraine and the cross as used in the Hungarian coat of arms. But since we're here, and as I say, this is uh, the Cross of Lorraine and Anjou. I would like to introduce you to the Cross of Anjou. And this is it. Now, the claim... Of, of, obviously, I'm, I'm, I'm just giving you the, the official spiel. But of course, the claim is that the wood, the, the, the black, that's, uh, that's wood. Uh, the claim is that it's, it's constructed from wood from the True Cross. Uh, this is from the official website. Uh, of the location where you could actually go and visit this actual relic. Now here it actually says that this cross was brought back from the Holy Land in 1244 and that the Cross of Anjou was subsequently adopted as the emblem of the Duchy of Lorraine under René of Anjou by 1379. So if we were to assume that they never used a two-bar cross before this relic then that means that its use in Matilda's time is actually historians being anachronistic with its application, and that's similar to Hungary. You see, we've ended up with a kind of international pissing contest, and this is a question of national pride for many. As, uh, now, the French, in modern times, they, they no longer really care about this, 
Uh, the Hungarians, they're a bit more nationalistic, so they do care about it. That's why they've insisted on the entry that's in Wikipedia. But to cut a long story short, there was a branch of the Anjou dynasty that did actually rule over the Kingdom of Hungary for the 14th century. And what you had, you had a bit of a, you could call it a piece of masterful propaganda that was actually put out. And so what you had then was you had the Anjou's depicting the early kings of Hungary using their cross of Lorraine. It's like here, this is a depiction of King St. Stephen. He's like the first recognised king of Hungary. Uh, you know, so, so, so he's gone back to about 1000 AD. And what the, and, and as you can see, but, but the actual uh, illuminated manuscript was actually produced in 1370 at the height of the Anjou dynasty ruling over Hungary. And so this is clearly uh, anachronistic, this use of the cross being applied to King Stephen. Whoever you decide to believe in this dispute, one thing is undeniable, whether it be the French or the Hungarians, they definitely got that design from the Byzantines. And here we are to trump them all from the 800s, you know, aka the 9th century. This clearly shows the Byzantine seal with the two-bar cross, the patriarchal cross, aka the cross of Lorraine. By all means, a Christian symbol, but no, it is not a Templar cross. Okay, so what actually is a Templar double cross? What we have is one cross and a double cross. There's, there's two ways of looking on it. You can either see it as being one cross stacked on top of the other, or as it would be more generally termed, a cross within a cross. And that is a Templar double cross. And where it'd be most commonly seen from a historical perspective, would be on the Portuguese fleet, aka the Order of Christ. By 1309, Temple Farm at Chelmsford was given to a knight by the name of Hanningfield. Not a Templar, just a knight. I know this might all sound a bit trivial when in the context of the original video, because this is not really the subject that, that, that's, that, that's the main thrust of their, of their video. However, when errors are made, they add up. When it's time to use your educated guesswork, if it's not built on fact, then you're on dodgy ground. You know, it's like suddenly 2 and 2 equals 6, or 69, and next thing you know, you're screwed. Okay, so it's time to put Hanningfield to bed. We're talking about the date 1309 and being awarded Temple Farm. The Hanningfields at no time owned or were given Temple Farm. What I'm going to do here, this is just to highlight where the confusion seems to have arisen. Because as you can see, this is making reference, this is history of Parliament. So this is looking at going right back to the earliest days. This guy's ancestor was a knight of the Shire, and so that's how we have the connection between the name Hanningfield and the date 1309 and the county of Essex. So here we have the Hanningfields lived in Essex and a namesake and ancestor of our MP, so the events of 1309 would have to be like his father or grandfather. It was knight of the Shire for that county in 1309 and 1313. So what this is saying, this has got nothing to do with getting land awarded to them or inheriting land. You need to understand what a knight of the Shire is to understand what's actually going on here. For that county in 1309 and 1313. Now a knight of the Shire was the original version of an MP, of a politician. You know, so this is in, in like the first type of parliament that was set up for England and the first type of people who would actually be called to represent an area would be called a knight of the shire 
and he was called in 1309 and again in 1313. That's how we've got a record of him because his name is in the rolls and it's got nothing whatsoever to do with acquiring land. He would have land in Essex and he also had land in the neighbouring county as well but those were not Temple Farm. If we go back to the Crescent Temple tab we can actually see what actually happened to Temple Farm at the dissolution of the Templars. So here we have, during the reign of King Edward II, the Templar Order was suppressed in England, with their estate at Cressing being handed over to the Order of the Knights Hospitaller in 1309. The actual Knight of the Shire was probably commanded to attend Parliament to discuss this actual dissolution of the Templars. I, I, I must clarify, that's just me speculating. You see, you see, because you've got to understand, when you're talking about the property of the Templars, that's not something that the king of, 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 of a kingdom could actually control. This was under the power of the Pope. The Templars and Hospitallers, they were exempted from uh, coming under scrutiny by the kings. Nobody could just simply come in and say, oh, okay, that's, uh, uh, you can get that land there, uh, Mr. Hanningfield. Only the Pope could decide what would happen to it. And the Pope, sure as hell, wasn't going to decide to, to just fritter away all the estates. You know, it's like he, was, he was wanting to keep it under papal control. So everything was supposed to go lock, stock and barrel over to the Knights Hospitaller. Now, as it happens, King Edward II was actually in a war with Scotland at the time. And so he was needing resources for his army. And so a lot of the Templar estates were plundered by the king before allowing the hospitalers to get access. And that's basically what happened at Temple Farm. Now banned, Templars went underground, disguising their organizations by different names, such as the Order of Christ, Knights of Christ. The Templars only needed to go underground in France because in France they were being arrested and tortured. But in other countries they were being treated with respect. Yes, they got arrested, yes, they got questioned, but they were never tortured. The only confessions came from the torture that was taking place in France. There was less than 60 of them were burned at the stake. And again, that was in France. That was terrible for those for those that actually got burned at the stake. But for everybody else, you know, and we're talking about an organisation, an order that's got about 20,000 people at this point. You know, as long as you're not in France, you did not need to hide, you did not need to go underground. The bulk of the Templars just simply switched to joining the Hospitallers, and the Hospitallers got the land anyway. So, so if you're talking about land workers, it was, it was effectively just like a change of management. Okay, it's not the Templars now, it's now the Hospitallers. My job's the same. There we go. And there's other places where they didn't even join another order, they just formed a new order, like the, like the Order of Christ in Portugal. Now banned, Templars went underground, disguising their organizations by different names such as the Order of Christ, Knights of Christ. <laughs> this order dropped the Templar L emblem of two knights on a single horse and replaced it with a double Templar cross. Two crosses. Now, he has referenced here a book by Karen Rawls, 2007, and the link is in here. As far as I can tell, Karen Rawls is a perfectly good researcher, so I'm unsure why she would be promoting this type of cross. That having been said, I do not have the book that is being referred to in this section. I'm not going to bother going out to buy it just to find out, but what may be happening is that they're misinterpreting what is being referred to as double cross if it, it has not been illustrated in the book. Alternatively, if there is an illustration of this type in the book, then I would say on this occasion, Karen Rawls is mistaken. What is being shown on the screen is not a symbol from the Knights Templar, it's a symbol from the Freemasons. Um, and it has a little bit more history, you know, on this, and it mentions the oldest Masonic written records in the world has some of this history on this. Um, I think the original compiler of this PDF uh, has, has gotten a bit confused about some things here. 
Right, so so what we're actually looking at is the PDF, a copy of the PDF that the couple in the video are actually reading from. And there's this part where, because it's a bit of an aside to what the couple are wanting to talk about, then they just kind of skim over this. And so I, I had to actually refer to the PDF to actually see what we're talking about. And the author of this PDF appears to be mistaken. This has got nothing to do with Temple Farm. It's to do with a, a different estate, which is actually in Essex. Is Daniel Williams? So, so this is like a a, a, a sort of preacher guy. Um, preacher guy. That's, that's that's not exactly the right word for it, is it? Yes, he was an influential theologian. Yeah, that. Yeah, we'll we'll leave it at that. What it's got here is Daniel Williams was involved with many charities called Tallis Hunt Major. Tallis Hunt Major is not the name of a charity; it's the name of a village. Yeah. His wife, his wife married again and sold the manor to Dr. Daniel Williams, who by a will settled it in trust in 1711 to provide £60 per year for the Society for New England, for two persons to preach in the English plantations in the West Indies, with the remainder to be paid yearly to the College of Cambridge in New England. So that's the charity work that is being referred to. The charity, they may well have named their, their charity after the, after the village, but the connection is actually that it's a completely different estate. It's nothing to do with Temple Farm. And here, well, the, uh, the video is going to go into this anyway, so I'll just mention it right now. So, that historical overview establishes that the old orders on the old map from the 1700s refers to the religious orders of the Templars, followed by other owners who clearly valued its religious heritage. Now, it, I understand why he's very keen to jump to this conclusion. Obviously, we've all, what we've actually established is that the old orders do not just refer to the Templars, it refers to the Templars and then the Hospitallers. Skipping now, so that historical overview establishes that the old orders on the old map from the 1700s refers to the religious orders of the Templars, followed by other owners who clearly valued its religious heritage. Just like Watchtower. Just like Watchtower. English Heritage have preserved a Templar building from that same era. And he's got the website here, and you can go see it. But you can see beautiful manor building, temple. Because the thing with the Knights Templar is that they, I guess, apparently had a temple on this property. This seems to be a relatively common misunderstanding. Just because temple is in the name does not mean that there's any connection with an actual temple for worship. Temple in the name simply means of the Templars, i.e. Templar property. That's all it means. It does not mean that there was any buildings of re religious significance or anything of, a of any exceptional note. Temple Farm was farmland. There would have been uh, a manor house which uh, the the preceptor would would have used to to a live in and b administer the estate from. It's not some exceptionally holy location. Okay, then we're going to go down to emblem. Before we consider the next map, it is worth noting the medieval Templar emblem, the royal seal of the Crusader Kings, which is on display in the National Library of France. Now, as you can see in here, it's got the double cross at the top, and then underneath that is a watchtower. The Royal Seal of the Crusader Kings. This, well, as the description says, is the Royal Seal of the Crusader Kings. The Templars were not the Crusader Kings. This is not Templar. Sometimes I wonder if people conflate Crusader and Templar as if it's the same thing. Templar is the specific military order. Crusader is anybody who went on crusade. I would like to think that I've already established that this cross is, in fact, the Cross of Lorraine. The Cross of Lorraine. But just to hammer it home, 
just for this specific point, you know, then hopefully we can start to move things along a bit and, and get this video something close to finished. <laughs> so otherwise we're going to be here forever. Um, we, let's go back to Matilda, who gave the, the, the land to the Templars in Chelmsford in the first place. And if we look at who her father was and her uncles, right, so that's three brothers, all the sons of Ida of Lorraine. Okay, so here we have Matilda of Bologna, her father, Eustace III. See, so Eustace and, her, and his brothers Godfrey of Bouillon and Baldwin of Bologna, these three were the foremost leaders of the First Crusade. I mean, we're talking Baldwin became Baldwin the First of Jerusalem. He was the first crusader king. His mother is Ida of Lorraine. The cross of Lorraine. On the seal of the crusader kings. Now, don't get me wrong, these people are all associated with and giving patronage to the Templars. But they are not Templars. And that is not a Templar seal, and that is not a Templar cross. <laughs> Note the Templar double cross and Tower of David. Watchtower. Double cross. Another old map exists from 1600 that shows the entrance road the Templar site marked with a stone or wooden monument in the form of a double cross. Now that's also where the English word double cross comes from right. because you know this Prince Philip and the Vatican turned on the Templars and double crossed them. Right. So that's where that term actually comes from. Okay, so maybe I'm being a bit cruel with this one, but to double cross someone in, in the English language does not actually come from, from the events surrounding the arrest of the Knights Templar. It's a romantic notion, but as much as I would like it to be true, it's not true. Basically, it's, it's, it, it comes from a much more recent uh, time period. It's more to do with the activities of highwaymen than it is anything to do with the Templars. Okay. Why would there be this road sign? Back in these days, the vast majority of people, they could not read or write. And so, what's the point of putting up a sign that they cannot read? Basically, it's pure guesswork as to why that specific cross is getting used as a marker. Were there, was there any writing on it? Nobody knows. But what it would indicate is that that's the entrance to the Crusader land. And so that would then apply not just to the Templars, but also to the Hospitallers. All right. Note the double cross is on a green mound, showing that it is an actual monument, not a map marker. And it has a name, Double Cross, Old English. This monument marked the entrance to the road leading off the Temple Farm. And then they mentioned even the Hungarian flag. Um, those are Knights Templar symbols. Back then when they created it, it was a Knights Templar based country. The leaders were. It was very Templar influenced, where they had an occupation there. Very much influenced with the double cross and the everything. And yeah, I mean, how is that surprising? I mean, literally, how is that surprising? It's not a conspiracy. At all. It's like having a Nazi occupation and then having the symbol on there. Yeah. Oh boy. There's so much wrong with what's just been said. Um, okay. I'm not going to repeat what I've been saying about the Cross of Lorraine. I feel comfortable that I've established that okay. Now, about this notion that the Templars occupied Hungary, I, I, I'm not sure if this is fantasy or if your special secret Masonic insider information that you got of your dad or your uncle or whoever the hell it is. Right, <laughs> there's, there's, there's three options here. You're either just making this up as you go along, you know, you know, you know just, just like inventing your own fantasy, 
Or somebody has told you nonsense just to deliberately misdirect you. Or somebody who you trust has just simply spun you a yarn just to, just to keep you happy. Either way, you're peddling nonsense. You're peddling pure, utter fantasy. Now let's have a look at the Templar locations and see which countries they were more likely to have been considered to have occupied. Now, Templar establishments in Europe. Let's, let's, let's take a look at this map, shall we? Now, funnily enough, France. The King of France was the one who got pissed off with them and got them suppressed. Funny that, huh? Maybe that's because he felt they were taking over his damn country. Now, where would we find Hungary? Look at this, this is the map of Europe. Where's Hungary? Where, 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 where is this infestation of Templars? I'll show you where Hungary is. Here it is. This is Hungary. Now, as it happens, Hungary also had control of Croatia, which is down here as well. And so, you have these three commanderies down here, technically in Croatia rather than Hungary, but it would be unfair of me to pretend that this was not under the Hungarian rule. So here, so here we have, like I'm saying, this is this is generally the the area that would be the king the the kingdom of Hungary, and down here this would be Croatia, you know Dalmatia, is here, and during the fifth crusade, Andrew the second of Hungary, he had a bit of a reputation of being a, a bit of a lazy king. And it's like he had to be prodded, shall we say, in order to fulfil his obligation to go on crusade. The Templars were asked by the king to run the administration for Croatia, and so they did that during the Fifth Crusade. Now regarding this notion that it was akin to some sort of Nazi occupation, I mean that's truly an insult to anybody who's actually done any proper research. Yes, Hungary did actually have an oppressive occupation, but it was not by the Templars. The Golden Horde a.k.a. the Mongols. In April 1241, there were two crucial battles, one in Poland, one in Hungary. They were just a couple of days apart from each other, and in both these battles, the Western nobles were crushed, totally crushed. The Templars were fighting to defend these lands. They were slaughtered. Now, the Knights Templar are Freemasons. And to kind of show you who the Knights Templar are, these are the steps of Freemasonry, all the different levels of it and all the different organizations associated with it, like openly, and at the very top, right there, that is the Order of the Knights Templar. So they're the highest level on the York Rite side, which is very, very significant um, to be that high, high level of a Freemason. And then if you see a lot of the Templar buildings, they're shaped a lot like um, watchtowers. <laughs> oh, yes, classic, classic, classic. Oh, we have hit the jackpot, ladies and gentlemen. We have hit the jackpot. And here we have it. I mean, we are talking such levels of bullshit that my detector has exploded. Okay, okay, let's, um, let's tackle this head on, shall we? If I said I was the King of France, would that make me the King of France? Similarly, if a Freemason says he's a Knight Templar, does that make him a Templar? Of course not. Imagine this a bit like the secret society equivalent of stolen valour. You see, if you can invoke the name of some ancient group such as the Knights Templar, that gives your words and your opinions and your theories added weight within the circle of people who are trying to explore the more esoteric aspects of life. You see... Freemasonry did not even exist before the 17th century, and by then, the real historic Knights Templar were long, long gone.
in order to understand the birth of Freemasonry, you need to have an appreciation of the geopolitics of the time, and that centres around the European wars of religion. It's going to take far, far too long to actually go into these intricacies. Let's just say I'll throw you some breadcrumbs so that if you're prepared to actually do your research, you will start to appreciate why a secret society could actually be beneficial in a time period when sectarian violence was not just a kicking in a playground. It was burning people at the stake. It was destroying entire towns. You know, it's like the Holy Roman Empire during the Thirty Years' War, which is only one part of the European Wars of religion, one third of the population died. They were either killed in battle, killed with disease, or starved to death. These were terrible, terrible times. And if you're wanting to have backdoor channels of communication open, then you do not want to do that in public. And so you've got a combination of people, people wanting to communicate with the other side. It's like basically we're talking the sectarianism here of Catholic versus Protestant. That's, I'll, I'll just leave it simplified like that. What if you've got someone who's a Protestant, but it's geopolitically advantageous for them to get favours done by a Catholic? That's one example. And then, of course, there are the the curious people interested in the esoteric. Naturally, they do not want to be burned at the stake just for their curiosity. And so the idea of a fraternity where it's safe and they would not betray each other is a very, very good idea to them. So you can understand how, in that climate, an organisation such as the Freemasons could flourish. So who started the Templar Masonic Conspiracy Theory? It was actually a faction of Freemasons themselves, and it was simply a rather petty attempt to declare their opinion more valid when in a dispute with another Masonic faction. But the idea had charm to it, so it stuck. You see, there are so many factions within Freemasonry itself that it's completely unfair to use blanket terms to describe all of them. For example, if I say that Freemasons believe something, there will always be Freemasons somewhere that do not believe it. So here's a list of all the things some Freemasons have claimed about their heritage. As you can see, I'm saying some Freemasons, i.e. not all Freemasons, etc, etc. None of these claims are true, but they have been made. Freemasons are Templars. Freemasons spawned from the Stonemason Guilds. Freemasons can be traced back to the builders of the Temple of Solomon. Masons can be traced back to the builders of the Pyramids. And Masons can even be traced all the way back to the builders of the Tower of Babel. And all of these are fake news. Incidentally, when I publish this video on YouTube, I expect there will be a warning appear under it that looks something like what I'm displaying on the screen right now. This is a good example of a topic that is considered controversial in some way, and so simply reading Wikipedia will be insufficient to gain a full insight. Masonic groups have experienced real persecution at times, and they were not always innocent. But when it comes to Wikipedia, they will either publish the explanation that is desired by those holding the most power, or will publish the explanation that is the most politically correct. Either way does not always result in accurate information being shared, hence the need for caution and a healthy dose of independent research. What about the incorrect cross being used by Freemasons who claim Templar heritage? I will tie this into the circular construction of Templar churches and make it my final point. While many Freemasons don't actually know their arse from their elbow when it comes to the Templars, other Masons are experts at syncretization, and so they will masterfully take the aspects they like from one system and weld it into their favourite aspects cherry-picked from other systems. This was originally an attempt to discover the original true religion given to man by God. But what was lost in this process was the importance of the number 8 to the Templars, and so the need for 8 points, i.e. a double cross, was overlooked in favour of crosses with 6 points, as the two-barred cross would offer 6 points, which could much more easily deputise for the double-headed eagle from a symbolic perspective. You see, Templars did not build circular churches to look like watchtowers. They built octagonally to emphasise the number 8, and the final exterior walls were sometimes made circular. The number 8 represents regeneration and resurrection. 
The Templars considered themselves to be the Knights of the Risen Christ, and emphasised this by using the number 8. OK, so here's the rub. Despite everything I've shared over the past hour, I have no idea if any of the speculation in the original videos has any merit. But I must admit, it's now very hard for me to take them too seriously because I already know the errors in the so-called factual sections. Nevertheless, I do hope they continue making videos because I find them entertaining. And I must admit, that they're probably not even going to watch this anyway. And let's be fair, a lot of the points I was actually talking about, they were very much minor, trivial, or points at a tangent to the main thrust of the videos that they were actually making. You know, it's, it's like these are not actually the main points in, in those videos. But there's always an asshole like me out there who's willing to point all those errors out. That's all I have time for today. Don't just take my word for it, of course. I've dropped enough information that should make it fairly straightforward for you to validate this stuff for yourself if you want to do so. Thanks for watching, and I'll catch you next time.